I'm Sarah Howard. I'm curator of public art and social practice for the Institute for Research in Art. To start, I'd like to conduct a land acknowledgement to honor the indigenous nations whose land we inhabit. We acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Seminole, Tokobago, and Timucua tribes' native lands that we are learning, working, and organizing today. It's important to remind ourselves of the history and colonial presence rendered invisible in these spaces and to honor with gratitude the earth for the resources it provides in our daily lives and those who came before who valued and protected those resources. Sponge Exchange and Flood Zone have been incredible platforms to engage with a broader network of arts professionals, experts, and community organizations addressing the climate crisis. We've engaged with a multitude of individuals and organizations in the research and presentation aspects of these exhibitions, ranging from the Florida Aquarium and its Center of Conservation to the Tarpon Springs Spongerama, the Sponge Exchange, Tarpon Strings Music Store, and Turn the Tide for Tarpon. I want to thank sponge expert and folklorist Tina Bukovalis, who's here with us today, for providing critical introductions to the Tarpon Springs community. And thank you for everyone who shared their expertise and support for the project. I also want to recognize CAMS Curator of Education, Leslie L. Sasser, Events Coordinator Ashley Jablonski, and Program Coordinator Amy Allison, as well as our Curator of New Media, Don Fuller, and our um, Graphic Designer, Marty uh, De La Cruz, for their help in organizing all of the aspects of the program today and throughout the uh, run of the exhibitions. I'm excited to, in, uh, to introduce our panel of brilliant experts, scholars, and dive into some of the issues surrounding the climate crisis using both Hope Ginsburg's and Anastasia Similova's practice and exhibitions as a launching board for the discussion. So before I introduce our panelists, our format today is I'll give a brief introduction of everyone, but uh, please know that there is an extended bio of each of our panelists in the program. And then each of them will come up and do a brief introduction of their work and their role in um, exploring climate crisis issues. And then we will open up, start our discussion, our dialogue. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start by briefly introducing each of them. Hope Ginsburg is an artist and associate professor at the Virginia Commonwealth of University in Richmond, Virginia. Her long-term projects engage collaborative, cooperative, and participatory modes of learning to stimulate social transformation, inspired by the historic sponge diving and contemporary coral restoration. Sponge Exchange explores the impacts of the climate crisis on coastal ecosystems. Anastasia Samilova is a Russian-American artist based in Miami. Her practice moves between observational photography, studio practice, and installation. Flood Zone presents Similova's ongoing photographic series reflecting the impacts of sea level rise in coastal communities of South Florida and highlights the friction between the natural and constructed landscape by focusing on the relationship between environmentalism, consumerism, and the picturesque. Dr. Ubike Haini is a visual studies scholar and curator with a focus on the intersection of ecology and artistic research. In 2018, Heine curated the NSF project Exploring the Arctic Ocean at the University of Texas Visual Arts Center. A collaboration with oceanographers and artists, the exhibition presented eight diverse projects that rely on the power of visual media to make these unknown waters accessible. C.J. Reynolds is Director of Resiliency and Engagement for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council and is a staff lead for the new Resil Resiliency Coalition, which currently includes 28 local governments focused on proactive planning for the impacts of climate change in the Tampa Bay region. CJ has an extensive experience working with scientists, leading companies, associations, and state and federal agencies to address emerging risks through the innovative education and private, public-private partnerships. Dr. Stephanie Wakefield is an urban geographer and teacher currently an Urban Studies Foundation International Postdoctoral Research Fellow based at the Florida International University in the Department of Global and Social Cultural Studies. Her work explores the political, technical, and metaphysical transformations of life in the Anthropocene. Thank you all for participating on today's panel and preparing a brief introduction of your own practice. We'll start with Hope.
Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, greetings, everyone, fellow panelists. Um, it's wonderful to be here um, at the Institute for Research in Art at USF. So um, you might have gotten wise to the fact that I'm a little bit obsessed with sea sponges. And um, one of the reasons for this, oh, so my timer's set and I make the picture happen. So one of the reasons for this is that, as you may also know, sea sponges are really the first animal, the first um, organism of the metazoa. So they're the first time that single-celled organisms came together and made an animal, made uh, an organism larger than the individual beings. So there's a real sort of originating model of collaboration and cooperation built into this organism. The image behind me is of a project called the Sponge Headquarters. It comes out of a 10-year project called Sponge um, that was really a platform for knowledge exchange, much the way sea sponges exchange nutrients with the other animals living on the reef. So this project involved student monitors at Virginia Commonwealth University, where it was cited, who worked um, together to create cooperative projects, um, often in which other people participated. So the image behind me is the student monitors of the Sponge Headquarters conducting an event, a needle felting event at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 2013. This is one example of a Sponge Headquarters project. So you can imagine, after working with sponges as a muse since 2006, my complete um, delight at reconnecting with Spongiorama in Tarpon Springs, Florida in 2014 when, um, when I was a resident at the Rauschenberg Residency in Captiva. And you may also know that um, in the back of Spongiorama is the world's most fascinating, idiosyncratic, kitschy, and wondrous gaggle of dioramas to do with the history of sponge diving. So the Spongiorama was the inspiration for a new series of collaborative dioramas called Coastorama, produced by the Coastorama Cooperative, which was a group of students. Some of them are here. I don't know if you want to wave your hands around wildly if you're in the audience. Great. Welcome, Sea Snail. Um, who produced the dioramas that are in the Sponge Exchange exhibition. Um, each diorama tackles a contemporary coastal ecology issue um, from the point of view of one species quite impacted by that phenomenon. So expanding from there, my fascination with marine invertebrates, I want to speak a little bit about the Project Swirling, which is the other large installation in the Sponge Exchange exhibition. And my collaborators, um, on the Swirling Project are here today, uh, diver, videographer, Matt Flowers, composer, Joshua Quarles, and editor, Alexis McCrimmon, are um, all part of making the Swirling Project happen. The project captures uh, coral reef restoration off the coast of St. Croix and kind of reveals this underwater phenomenon, brings it uh, onto land so that you as viewers can kind of swirl in, um, in this multi-screened video installation and try to, um, along with us, get your heads around whether this phenomenon of, of tending to baby coral at the bottom of the ocean and then reattaching them onto the reef to hopefully thrive is um, optimistic, uh, a sign of great hope, or with divers literally walking around on the bottom of the ocean with plastic laundry baskets full of Atlantic hard coral, <laughs> the kind of ultimate vision of human folly. So I think this piece is meant to um, really pose questions. And, um, and you'll see when you see the installation that the fourth channel in the video, which is healthy outplanted coral with many fish that have returned, um, has been excerpted from the other three channels because it's really only one possible end to uh, a narrative that we're all part of constructing right now. Um, my time is, is dwindling, and I know we want to move on to hear from many other people, so I'll just wrap up with um, a nod to this series of works called Land Dive Team, in which a group of people meditate with scuba gear on land in sites that can be interpreted um, or, or sort of mined for their environmental uh, implication, such as a group of people meditating in scuba gear at the shore of the Bay of Fundy, which has the highest tide rise on the planet, as the tide flows in and rises on our bodies until we're gone. And that's a video piece. 
There's some images from that piece in the show. And I'll just end by letting you know that there will be a land dive performance in Tarpon Springs on February 23rd. Um, please come dive with us. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I hope you had a chance to see our exhibition at the museum. Um, just, I think looks remarkable, I'm really proud and very happy um, that Sarah and the team has executed my vision so precisely, really surpassed my expectations with the show. Um, the project Flood Zone um, only became a project a couple years ago. Uh, I moved to Miami in 2016 and as Sarah mentioned, uh, I come from Russia, so I'm an immigrant with this, from this Nordic climate. Uh, subtropical environment was very new for me. Uh, I lived in Midwest for a while, I moved for graduate school in Chicago area. So um, 2016 was the hottest summer on record, which of course have been surpassed now by the 2019 summer. Um, and um, Observational photography is really not even my background. Um, I used photography as sort of a medium of, re of record, for, of the like utilitarian medium uh, for recording my tableaus. I would build installations and then document them in my studio. Um, the work was inspired by the sort of Amazons of Russian avant-garde of 1910s and 20s, revolutionary period, uh, by painting and architecture, which is my education. Uh, from back in Moscow. And then Miami happened. Uh, and just to process this new environment, I found myself outside in the streets with my camera. And I thought the distance of my lens would allow me a bit of a separation from what I was experiencing um, and sort of a fresh perspective. Uh, the images you see here are spreads from my book that just came out. Stephanie has a copy right here. Conveniently, it's uh, at the museum as well. So this is a sort of complete version of, of this iteration of this project, Flood Zone. Uh, and it focuses on um, a few southern states. There's Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, uh, and Georgia. Um, and here are some spreads from the book. So the pairings were um, made by my editor and writer, David Campany, who was here yesterday and will be coming again on January 26th for our conversation at the Oxford Exchange. Um, so I, I just let it really flow, um, this project. I was out with my camera uh, gathering a lot of material, not knowing uh, what will happen with that. I was um, working for some editorial assignments, um, and then in 2017, Irma hit, and this is actually our building's garage, and this is my son, and this is our flooded um, space right there. You can see my shadow on the right side. Um, he's wearing a bicycle helmet. We went exploring. Streets were covered in sand. There was mandatory evacuation in Miami Beach. Uh, we didn't take it seriously enough until we realized we were one of the three families left in the entire building. Um, the project I was um, working on prior to Flood Zone was called Landscape Sublime. Um, it dealt with sort of mediated landscape in the abundance of pictures sort of permit um, uh, the internet. Uh, well, here it was the experience of the real sublime, I thought, the howling wind and just the overwhelming scale of that hurricane that we observed from our window. Um, some images are just observations of really daily life. The majority of them are. Um, I don't want to show um, these coastal areas in sort of peak catastrophe moments that is not my goal. There's a sense of irony in some of them. Um, and I notice the, again, the, the presence of those images, the images that plaster 
um, the city. And some of these um, became the sort of freestanding billboards in the show. This is an aerial shot of a not flooded Merritt Island area. This is actually just how um, those waterfront homes are built, and this is the land on the left that gets developed. Um, some sort of pairings here tell a story better than single images. Of course, the gator on the facade of the museum um, is a symbolic. Oh boy, did they run out of time? You can see more in the show and in the book, of course, that has over 80 images. Well, thank you. We should wrap it up. <laughs> Put three of these so you can get a chance to see them. I can't figure out how to turn off that noise. It's supposed to be subtle. Um, hello, everybody. Of course, I didn't watch the time when I prepared my presentation, so I'm just going to skip a few steps. In the week. And if you have any questions, we can probably um, talk about that during the, um, the discussion. And I'm going to start with some shameless self-promotion. Um, I'm a visual studies scholar. So that means I studied um, art history and cultural sciences, and I'm very interested in the societal function um, of images, especially photographs. And I spent the past um, too many years working on uh, or doing a research project on photographic uh, projects dealing with the topic of climate change. And the starting point for that many years ago was that I observed that climate change had become a topic popular amongst photographers um, in the late 2000s, um, and especially after the publication of the Force Assessment Report of the International Panel um, on um, Intergovernmental Intergovernmental Panel on Global Climate Change in 2007, and that was also kind of uh, a breakthrough point for climate change in the public discourse or public perception of climate change, at least for a little while. And when I say photographers, um, that is the shameless self-promotion. Um, this is the book that came out last year and is kind of the final, my final point to that research project. Um, when I say photographers, I'm talking about uh, nature photographers who created systematic inventories of the changes in the flora and fauna that um, had started to occur around the globe and that were increasingly connected with climate change. I'm also talking about photojournalists um, that took these physical changes and uh, connected them to the consequences on human communities around the world. Um, and these photojournalists were usually sort of in the, working in the tradition of the so-called concerned um, photography. I'm also talking about artists um, who are working in the field, mostly in the field of um, landscape photography and who created photo books and exhibitions to stimulate a deeper reflection of the cultural and political implications of climate change. Um, across the spectrum of practices, I noticed that the photo photographers were trying to do different things. They were trying to provide visual evidence of the changes, um, which is sometimes happening in remote places. So the photographers really kind of worked as mediators and as the people bringing the images back from those places. Um, they were trying to help um, frame scientific findings in a more relatable manner and more tangible way. And they, of course, wanted to contribute to establishing climate change as one of the most relevant political topics of the time. Uh, some of my key findings, conclusions from that project were that, um, indeed, those photographers helped establishing a global, um, or uh, the image of climate change as a global phenomena. They did so by um, creating and repeating visual tropes, images that have um, that would capture the very essence of certain symptoms and consequences in a way that is easy to understand and relate to. Um, these tropes, tropes were mostly informed by um, scientific studies, especially of the force the IPCC report. And um, we can talk about the flip side of that later. And they also created blind spots. I'm going to skip to my curatorial practices and I'll get that in. Um, I'm also, I started working as a curator at the same time working that I was working on the research project. And one of the sort of takeaway, personal takeaways from my research project were that we should listen a little better to the science and we should really sort of help them get the word out. And we should also sort of try to, you know, now that we have a global image of climate change or an image of climate change as a global phenomenon, look at a more sort of specific 
issue related to climate change. And I started working with a group of climate scientists in Austin, Texas in 2017. They're computer, uh, computational oceanographers, which is a very complex field of research. And they have been working on the Arctic Ocean, and they invited me to conceptualize an outreach component for their project, uh, which was um, a very interesting task, which is still ongoing. Um, the first uh, sort of phase of their project was that I conceptualized uh, an exhibition for them, a group show, in Austin, Texas, that was on view in the fall of 2018. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we actually found a way to visualize um, the sort of uh, research outcome, the core research results of this project. We used the data visualization. That was about two minutes long. It's a dynamic um, video. It, it shows sort of the circulation or the flow of North Atlantic water into the Arctic Ocean. Um, and we also felt the need of sort of explaining that and sort of uh, bringing in a, a piece of, medita of uh, mediation, which you see on the left-hand side, which is a narrated slideshow and it talks about how oceanographers actually get from the basic equations that they work with um, to uh, that sort of highly complex piece of visualization. That's it, I'm sorry. <laughs> My box gets set, go. First, I want to say thank you and recognize all the tremendous work done by the Contemporary Art Museum. Over the years, many issues have been brought forward. We are so fortunate as a community to have them there. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I think we've been talking about marine issues, climate change for, I don't know, many years and when I was at the College of Marine Science. So I particularly appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, this morning to talk to you in my new role as the Director of Resiliency and Engagement at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. So what is that? That is an organization that works with six counties and multiple cities uh, throughout the region on particularly contentious issues. It used to be growth management, now our largest issue is really understanding the impacts of the changing climate. In our region, it's about uh, nearly $1 billion in damages in the past five years just from floods and storms and no-name storms and that sort of thing. So you can tell already that we're quite at risk from a variety of flood-induced things, not to mention the future changes related to heat. So um, speaking of heat, it does, it continues to get hotter. And one of the most important things and very difficult for all of us to understand is why? And it's the carbon issue in the environment. In our region this year, uh, transportation has surpassed all other sources of carbon emissions. So when you think about uh, issues to address and visualize, um, carbon reduction is really significant and how we can address mass transportation for all people uh, in, throughout the region. It is not a local issue, it cannot be solved locally. So that is what uh, created the, the mass excitement and momentum behind forming a resilience coalition. Uh, so the words uh, Hope mentioned before about collaborative. So this is really a new initiative for the region and something to give us uh, folks uh, some you know, enthusiasm about what our government is trying to do. The Southeast had one for 10 years. We now have one and it's really action uh, oriented and it's particularly looking for ways to bring local governments together, elected officials from different uh, points on the spectrum on how we can address uh, the issues of climate change and resiliency. But we can't do it alone, it really takes the entire village. And so in that, we've also engaged and are working to collaborate with uh, businesses and a list of organizations. And I'm very excited uh, to be able to partner with uh, the uh, School of USF and Public Health, as well as the uh, Architecture and Community Design Center and a variety of other folks that have uh, come to me and said, we have ideas for how to work together more effectively to address uh, climate change and sea level rise. And don't forget about these people and let's do this and this and this. So the interdisciplinarity is significant in our work. Um, one of the groups has come together to define what is our regional risk to sea level rise, and, and it is different. It is not the same as what the southeast is, and so many times we hear the global aspects of that. Um, there has been seven inches since 1946, which may, doesn't sound like a lot. It's increasing, and that's the difficulty. But seven inches, when you look at a giant storm drain and how things drain, is actually a lot when those things were built in 1950. So you can understand why certain areas flood 
again and again. So this is significant that we have this data and the information uh, that all local governments are beginning to agree on this and use it to develop their programs and, and change how we think about things. So these are some, uh, you know, the scary images which people try to think about. One is the one on, uh, on the left side is really reflecting of now and what is a category one hurricane versus category three. The one on the right side is in 2045, just 25 years from now, how small amounts of sea level rise even at that point really make a significant difference in how bad the storm surge will become and affect us. So bringing folks together, we uh, had our first summit on January 7th and 8th, 330 local governments, or 330 participants from a variety of uh, local governments, private sector, uh, NGOs, university folks, uh, met to discuss what is going to be our regional action plan. What is it going to look like? What are the different priorities that we will uh, discuss and address? And uh, we're making great progress on that. I expect to see a lot of the uh, table priorities. Uh, again, the USF uh, School of uh, the Community Design Center is helping us to bin these things together to help me and able to reach out local governments. So one of the things I wanted to leave you with is there's two things you can do. And thank you for those of you who drove your electric cars here. We appreciate that. Go. Um, however, one one of the significant things you can look at in terms of policy is that concrete is not our friend. We need to allow the water to drain, to recharge the aquifer, uh, avoid um, runoff into our oceans and our bays, and if we can learn how to absorb water in the place. So anything that you can do to help your local government our landscape architecture, the conceptualization of letting rain drain and keeping it in place is very significant. So I used this at a Florida League of Cities um, meeting two years ago to encourage the elected officials, you know, we always need a positive theme. We cannot focus on the negative. So remember this operation, unpaved paradise. So think about what you can do to do that. So thank you for your time. All right. Thanks everyone um, at the museum and thanks Sarah for having me. Um, so uh, I'm an urban geographer and a teacher. Um, I just moved to Miami uh, where I'm based at FIU. Uh, I moved there about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm doing a project there on the sort of experimental practices people are developing at different scales for dealing with environmental change. Um, before moving to Miami, I was in New York for most of my life um, where I taught for about a decade at Queens College um, at the New School. So in general, my work sort of looks at, uh, broadly speaking, the social, technological, and political transformations of life in the Anthropocene. Um, ah. Here's a nice representation of the Anthropocene from Earth System Science perspectives. Um, you, you probably are familiar with the term. It's become quite popular in recent years. But um, broadly speaking, it, it, the Anthropocene is the name for the sort of moment that we're living in, um, in Earth history where the planet is sort of shifting, as you can see here, that little, little blue dot shifting out of the stable climates that defined the last 11,000 or so years in which all modern civilizations primarily developed um, and onto a new trajectory. As you can see there, moving towards an unknown operating state with a question mark right there. Um, and this, this trajectory is being propelled by climate change, rising seas, uh, desertification, and a whole set of uh, environmental processes that are underway being um, uh, pushed forward by industrial capitalism. I think we can also see the Anthropocene as a social and a political phenomenon as well. So it's not just that we're seeing the sort of uh, baselines of uh, earth systems coming undone that grounded modern society, but also the social and philosophical baselines coming undone and sort of in disarray. So in general, in that context, in the context of being on that trajectory towards the question mark, uh, my work, broadly speaking, looks at the rise of experimentation as a new modality of dealing with these upheavals. So I look at it uh, in two sort of different registers. I look uh, first at experimentation in the realm of governance. So the way in which governance, the way in which populations and environments are managed and ordered, the way in which governance um, is really transforming, uh, and the way in which a lot of uh, city planners and designers and politicians are looking for experimental pra practices of resiliency um, to try to overturn old modes of urban planning, for example, um, in the new context of the Anthropocene. So here, uh, I've done a lot of research, for example, um, on the use of oyster reefs 
as a, a living infrastructure to um, attenuate and manage rising seas and storm surge. Um, and this is a project being developed in New York City um, on the southern coast of Staten Island after Hurricane Sandy. And it's sort of very much heralded as a, a paradigmatic design um, for the Anthropocene and for urban resilience, um, the use of nature uh, to deal with storm surge rather than hard walls, cement blocks, right, this kind of thing. Um, and it's really, really celebrated for sort of overcoming the, the modern nature, society, city, culture, binary that really, really grounds the Anthropocene. Um, I'm also uh, looking now at Miami Beach and, and some of the infrastructures being developed there, also experimental, um, but in a different way. The experimental there, because what we're seeing is an attempt to actually elevate the entire city to deal with rising seas. Um, and, and what I've argued, I look at these, these projects in sort of an empirical way. You know, what are the challenges of growing oyster reefs um, off the coast of uh, New York in a very, very polluted industrial place, right? But I also look at sort of the political, social dimensions of these kinds of projects. Um, and what, I, what I've argued, you know, in, in broad strokes is that there's a lot of experimentation going on and a lot of talk of innovation, and in fact, a lot of innovation. But this is being geared towards actually maintaining the existing social, political, economic uh, frameworks in cities as they, as they are amidst environmental change. Not preventing environmental change, not preventing crisis. Right? Um, the second way in which I look at experimentation is sort of a counter to that stasis model that I, that I identify in, in resiliency quite often. And here I look at um, a lot of the experimental practices that we're seeing just ordinary people, working class, ordinary people around the world, um, developing in response to changing environments. So here, I'm really interested in sort of arguing against a lot of the, the critical theory that we're seeing come out around the idea of the Anthropocene, which says that life in the Anthropocene <laughs> is a matter of sort of bare survival and, and like dwelling in ruins. And here, what I'm trying to argue um, by looking at different practices people are developing is that actually there's a lot of incredible experimentation going on by ordinary people um, that is, is, is really pushing the boundaries on what it means to be human, what it means to live in changing environments. So for example, um, the development of amphibious architecture by fishermen. This is one experiment I'm looking at. I'll stop there, thanks. <laughs> Thank you all. It's such a great, uh, diverse set of experience we have here on our panel today. All right, so let's dive in. Um, in preparing for these shows over the past few years, we've seen the anthropogenic uh, global climate crisis become more urgent. Awareness continues to grow as temperatures rise, increasing the intensity of cyclones, wildfires, and sea level rise, causing a cascading series of harmful effects like drought, poor air and more water quality, and toxic algae blooms. I personally have been conceptualizing this period that we're in of heightened urgency and awareness as kind of a transitional space, um, a liminal frontier similar to that of a tidal zone, as described by author Elizabeth Rush in the book Rising Dispatches from the New American Shore, where she quotes poet and environmental activist Gary Schneider. He says, a frontier is a burning edge, a frazzle, a strange market zone between two utterly different worlds. Both flood zone and sponge exchange invite viewers to look more closely at our world and focus our attention on the shifting coastline and transforming environment to bring into question the ability of the planet's inhabitants to adapt to these new frontiers. We understand the power of art to communicate and evoke emotional responses, but how can the power of this imagery create awareness, influence perceptions and behaviors, and potentially serve to reimagine the future of this next frontier. What can art bring to the speculative spaces of science and technology, and how does that impact our decisions moving forward? Would anybody like to start? Stephanie? Sure, sure. <laughs> no one else wants to, like, sure. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question. I, um, I read a, a really interesting journalistic piece a couple months ago by Andrew Sullivan. I think he was in New York Magazine about uh, climate change and the Anthropocene. And he was saying, um, you know, alongside the fact that we're living in the sixth great extinction, that he said, you know, I think the other half of the great extinction event that we're living through is the extinction of imagination, of human imagination. Um, and, and I think this is totally accurate. I think in a lot of ways that what we're seeing, faced with one of the most um, 
catastrophic, transformative moments in human history, at least that, that, we, that we are aware of, um, we're seeing a real impoverishment of um, imaginaries, uh, a lack of imagination in, in every field. And I think we all often, whatever fields we're coming from, feel it in, in our respective places. Um, and so I, to me, I wonder, what if we were to say, you know, um, in, in art, as much as in ecology, where I often work, you know, um, what would it mean to try to um, open up spaces where we can actually <laughs> imagine the unknown and we can actually um, create things that are unknown, rather than actually just perpetuating the same existing institutions, the same existing frameworks? Um, because it seems to me that climate change, the climate crisis, Anthropocene, calls for everything to change. Um, and to actually try really audacious experiments right now. Um, and you know, I'm not an artist, but I, most of my friends are artists. I think I, I, I really always like to collaborate with people in the arts because it always seems that it's in the art that it's actually possible to do something new um, and to think beyond boundaries. Mm -hmm. So this, this to me could be a potential way of thinking about artistic practice right now. I think that, okay, so I'm not the artist. I shouldn't answer this, but I would say I'm going to agree that this need for imagination is, is so important. A lot of the visual attention, both uh, from the scientific world and in the, the governance and in the media, as you know, is all really about the negative impacts of anything. Um, and, and so that's the challenge that we have um, because of what society deems newsworthy becomes a very harsh thing. We do need to understand how change is going to um, the true environmental changes, and so I think the historic and documentation of these and the changes over time, what's wrong with the loss of the snowpack, <laughs> and what's wrong with the ocean qualities changing and these things. Um, the, the need for imagining community as a part of this is really <coughs> significant, and it's a big um, disconnect, and, and because in many worlds, and particularly in government, and the local governments are really struggling to address this in a more proactive way is the siloism. So this engineering group and this program group and this housing group are all very disconnected. So when we're trying to look at things in the context of what can our communities be like in the future, how do you define future? Is that 20 years or is that 60 years? And how long will these buildings last? And what should we think about what's going to happen to nature and the role of artistic practice in helping us to uh, be more in touch with all of these elements that are, are emotional components and, and hope was really helping me understand constructed identity. These are a lot of things that I don't understand, but we have so many different pieces about identity going on that are creating the opposition where in many cases, if we really thought about things, we'd find ourselves more on common ground. So that's, uh, I'm not an artist, as I said. That's it. <laughs> oh, well, Throw it to you. Now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, I just, um, Sarah's question and some of the other res um, responses about the role of the artist makes me think of a great text by an artist and writer named Claire Pentecost, who is writing about the idea of the public amateur and the idea that the artist can play this role of, of public amateur, that we can approach a discipline, have sort of access with a kind of liberty that gives us a critical distance from that discipline, like science, like government. Um, government practice and, and, and operate um, as we learn in public. And so I think this idea of, of interdisciplinarity, of a, kind of, of a kind of public performance of what we love, the amateur is the performance of what we love, and, and of a kind of willingness to learn in public, to make knowledge through our work is really one possible function of the role of the artist I would, that I would just throw out there as a thought. Yeah, that's something I have um, noticed while working on the, the exhibit in Texas that sort of really focusing on the process and kind of leaving it open and creating exhibitions that work, that don't present a thesis. Um, you know, while doing my research, on the other hand, I've seen a lot of projects that followed a very uh, exhibitions and books that followed a very stringent sort of problem solving strategy, putting out the sort of documentation of the symptoms and consequences, um, talking about the causes, and then presenting possible solutions. So there was this very distinct didactic approach, especially in the um, early 2010s, um, where you would see, okay, this is really like we're trying to sort of 
present information about climate change in form of an exhibition. I think if we could move away from that and sort of create more open ex exhibits and exhibitions sort of as platforms to discuss um, imaginaries to sort of open up um, discussions as Sarah did with her exhibit, I think that's that's a good way to go and that is sort of as a, from the perspective of a curator, that's something we should nurture, sort of keeping that, not streamlining it into um, sort of an information-based um, uh, but sort of format, but really keeping all the sort of ways of looking at art open and making climate change maybe one of the possible mm -hmm. interpretations. Mm -hmm. To piggyback on that, um, as somebody um, who is a, who's English second language person, you know, communicative power of imagery is something that I think about a lot. And with photography, especially this observational, straightforward photography, um, I thought my ability to reach a wider audience um, was, was quite high. Um, photography has uh, this ability to, to travel far. So this work has been published in articles and magazines um, and, and online, and now it is exhibited in this museum setting. And who knows, you know, I keep seeing it all over. So I think this, this reach of the wider audience, um, the book that I just showed came out in Europe. It was really interesting to see Europeans' reaction to this kind of depiction of, of Miami. Um, the response was that it was nothing like they've expected. And the imagery that's associated with the city is quite different from, from what I presented in the book. Um, so I think for, for that reason, um, I guess going back to your question, um, the responsibility of the artist, um, in my case, is to, to communicate, I think. Great. Thank you. We'll move on and we can circle back as we find fit. Um, so we often hear and see data protections for sea level rise, drought, mass displacement and extinction extended out for decades, past some of our own lifetimes. Time is a major challenge to communicating the crisis of the changing climate. Both exhibitions employ time as a way of communicating the immediacy and evolving conditions of the climate crisis. The Costa-Rama dioramas compress time and space form formulating potential tableaus of the future, while Simolova's flood zone photographs expand time documenting the slow and subtle transformations to the environment. And in, in each of your views, how does this, our conception of time as an abstract concept or concrete measurement for scientific predictions affect our mindset about climate? So there's a, a whole study of the perception of time, and there's a, if I could go, you know, a new career, I'd be a futurist. Um, so the, there's the, the concept of how humans perceive time. Um, you can learn a lot about it from behavioral economics, which is that we actually make trade-offs constantly about our benefits for the now against the risks and benefits of the future. And so this is the great challenge of anything, of getting people to buy life insurance or invest in your retirement or any kind of thing where you have a, a current and present uh, need to sacrifice or give something up or do something less or do something massively different when it's going to benefit some, even yourself in the future, let alone the someone else, the other, the public in the future. And so I think this is one of the big challenges of um, local government has, uh, we have these unsung heroes, they're called planners, urban planners. They, they work, they try to think, they try to visualize. Some of them live in, in really understanding a lot of these different issues to figure out where we need to go 20 years down the road and convince a variety of people to support that, both internally as well as the getting better input from the public. The challenges of time when we have these also attachments to place and also mental attachments, I think, to simpler times. These are the things that um, we, as we talk about these things, recognizing that this is what we all live with, and, and I don't have any solutions for that, but just enabling people to talk about our mental frameworks, about time, I think is something we're gonna have to do a better job at, and, and what that means, and helping people understand that you actually make these trade-offs all the time, right, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank 
Thanks for passing the baton again. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a book that I have next to my couch that I now wish I'd read all the way through. Um, but, but the book is called Timefulness, and it is a geologist's perspective on um, time and climate. And she's really able to offer um, a, a, a chance to glimpse or grasp just the huge expanse of time and give us some perspective, which, as you mentioned, we kind of so direly lack in our stopped up, frantic, um, contemporary lives. And so I guess if I had one thing personal to offer, I think that it fe you know, things feel so, so urgent, and when things feel urgent, it's so, um, it, it feels like the obvious thing to do is to speed up and to become more frantic and, and panicked. And I, I just think that that maybe it's counterintuitive, but um, my, my time-centric response is um, the offering of, of slowing down. I think in a, in a similar vein to that. Um, so uh, in my life, a lot of the, my time has been spent also in political organizing and, and, and in teaching and in thinking and, and actually concretely organizing um, infrastructures uh, and so on. And, and one of the questions that's really followed me everywhere um, throughout all my different projects has been, uh, you know, why is it that revolutions have not succeeded? Or why is it they've produced um, maybe more negative outcomes? Or, you know, where, how, do we, how do we break through the present? If we feel that we're at an impasse, how do we break through it? Um, and, and I think repeatedly, one of the big questions um, for thinking about big historical change, transformative change, is the way that we think about time and the way that we think about change. So, um, uh, apocalypticism, I think, is very, very um, common, both in terms of how we think about crisis and catastrophe, and in how we think about political transformative change. Um, the same sort of structure animates this, this way of thinking, which is that there's some event off in the future. Um, at that moment, everything changes. And now, we have a new world. Now, we have the disaster, you know? And then there's the day after, that kind of thing. And of course, there are insurrections, and there are huge uprisings that do happen like that, right? But there's also this ongoing now that we inhabit um, in the same way with the climate crisis. There, there are Sandys and Irmas and all of this and, you know, Maria's, but there is also the ongoing now of the Anthropocene that we inhabit. So to me, a, a big question is how do we, first of all, do we want to? And if, if we do, how do we shift into that other kind of time register um, that the, 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 the crisis is already happening and potential for real transformation is already here now? What would it mean to take that very, very seriously? Everybody who talks about the, you know, this is the end of the world, this is the apocalypse. Well, if you if you really believed that, what would you do? You know, what would it look like to inhabit that as a, an ongoing now? I feel climate change is already catching up with us, and we're seeing all these um, very concrete events that we can we're able to actually relate to climate change into the sort of bigger picture of it. Um, so that that question is very interesting, but especially living here in Florida, you kind of you feel like okay, next hurricane season is already kind of at our doorstep. So, you know, we don't really have to sort of imagine far away futures. We can actually sort of relate to that and see how we feel about it and how we feel about, um, you know, living in Florida and living with those uh, very um, concrete dangers. So I feel like um, that need of um, imagining far away futures is not like we're already, we're already there and we're already in it. And um, I think if we, we can sort of relate that to um, our own actions in some ways, and maybe it's something we can talk about, um, I think we're already there. You know, we don't have to sort of conceptualize that far away future framework. Like we can, we have to, right now, we have to deal with these sort of consequences that are very real and everywhere. Yeah. I think my, my thinking of time is um, directly related to the medium of choice for photography. You know, Lens-based media is so well suited for time stopping, right? So freezing those moments. Um, and so um, picking up photography as my medium, it, it seemed like um, the events unraveling around me were worth reporting. And um, it, it's, it felt urgent to document what I was seeing. Some of those buildings in the show are no longer there. And then some areas, um, like CJ was saying, are now have concrete poured all over and new condos being um, sprouting all throughout the city. Um, so photography has this ability to create a sort of time capsule as well, and I'm, I'm aware of that, um, and careful to not sort of desensitize the audience with images of catastrophe. So that's why I purposely 
don't photograph um, the disasters. There's only one, two photographs of actual flooding that was um, hurricane related. Um, most of the images are of, sort of everyday observations of everyday life. Because that's, um, I guess, the, the project, since it's so f felt, you know, through on a personal level, um, we don't experience climate change as this rapid turn of events, right? There are certain um, occasions of that that sort of signify what's to come. But overall, um, I'm stealing this from, I don't remember who's right, maybe Davis Wolf Wells uh, or Jeff Goodell's book, um, Water Will Come. Uh, watching climate change is like watching your kids grow. You turn around and they're significantly taller. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is sort of the, I really like that metaphor and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, show that throughout the project too. And I know Stephanie and I, when we talked earlier, uh, we were talking about sort of like the cycles of real estate in Florida and how, how many cycles do we think that we can you know, still get out of our coastal regions um, because the state is so reliant on the tax base for real estate and tourism industries. Mm -hmm. And sort of that, looking at that, like what are those cycles looking like and how can we potentially project out or reclaim those spaces as we need to, to provide resiliency for the, as the geography changes, right? Okay, okay, does anybody have anything to add before we move on to our next question? Okay. As responsible citizens, many of us have made changes to our lifestyles and behavior to include more environmentally conscious decisions <laughs> like eating a plant-based diet, reducing our use of plastics, carpooling or using public transportation to reduce our carbon footprint. While these efforts make an impact and help us to feel like we're doing something, anything, to help the planet, they remain focused on the personal individual response rather than the larger collective action that can change policy on a wider, more effective scale. What are some ideas that each of you may have for personal resiliency strategies to cope or adapt to the physical and, and, and psychological impacts of climate crisis or larger ideas for radical restructuring of our societal systems? So on, on the personal level, I think the, so I have a lot of friends who vote on all sorts of different components and have political affiliations along the spectrum. And that's my job is to work with them. And I have a lot of other friends who get really preachy. And, and so the, I think the personal component, if we are committed to changing and working to change society, is to de-escalate our judgment and truly really try to uh, work across the aisle, as they say, is, is although the media and all these things we, and so I listen to a span of political news every day from the most far right to the most far left, a variety of uh, racial perspectives and other kinds of things. And you really have to figure out what's all motivating us. So I think if we can you know, dial back a lot of the judgment and figure out how communications really plays a role in a barrier to change. To me, this is one of the things we can personally take that action to figure out where somebody who you think may or may not be I mean, if I come in and yell at you and tell you you're, you're stupid, you're not going to change your behavior. Understanding our deeply held belief systems about what motivates people from the, you know, economy to God to Gaia to whatever, these are the deeply held things that we have to work more on. That's the personal takeaway from that. And then I think because that helps you to find the policy and the program commonality that you can in, find how, ways to work with people who don't share your immediate direct belief system. But recognizing the larger challenge, that's, it's, you know, we're going to have to make these trade-offs. And that is unpalatable to people who are on very far ends of certain things. There can be no trades. There can be no compromise because it's such a crisis, that in of itself is creating uh, the barriers to change. So recognizing that, which doesn't sound, I don't want to sound like I'm selling out or finding these middle grounds, but um, so on a, on a more local level, uh, the need to vote locally. 
is so important. And then finally, on the radical transformation, which is such a challenge for our region, we need elected officials who will support regional transportation. People live in Pasco County, drive to Hillsborough County. People who live in Hillsborough County, drive to Pinellas County for work. I spend like easily two to three hours a day on the road driving to get to work. We need regional mass transit. So if you hear elected officials just talking about local transportation, it's not enough. It's not gonna help us solve this issue. We need better transportation. We couldn't take our bus to get to here if we wanted to because it takes so long. The connectivity from that, okay, I'm off on a rant, sorry. No, no. But anyway, please, okay. Here. <laughs> so mass transit is a desperate need, as you saw, the reduction of carbon. We have to slow down the heat. We have to do this because we can, you know, as a society, you know, as they say, that there's the carbon is going to continue to increase, even if we turned it off today, 50 to 60 years. So if we address this more quickly versus figuring out the flood reduction strategies, these are the big challenges of where government is going to have to make investments. But mass transit should be one of our first and major ways to reduce the carbon. And then all else from solar to electrification of things that also are based on solar. These are key things that you can take both personally, but again, vote, policy change, send your letters. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's um, some statistics there that um, if the top 10% of the most conspicuous emitters would reduce their emissions to just European Union average, the world, the global emissions would drop by 35%. So you won't really get there, you know, through individual dietary choices, but through global policy changes. Um, if it, um, I, I saw an article somewhere just came out about Miami being the worst commute, uh, having the worst <laughs> commute in the nation. Wow. And every time I'm sitting in traffic in Miami Beach, and I have tried bicycling to my son's school, I, I did not feel safe. Um, yeah, every time I'm sitting there in traffic, you know, and especially during Art Basel, where it's impossible <laughs> to get through the island, uh, and then there's that installation of, of sand cars on the beach. How ironic it is, you know, we're sitting there and just drowning ourselves. Yeah. Um, I agree that sort of it has to be an integration of uh, collective action of policy, but I wouldn't underestimate the the personal choice and. It's interesting because um, you know I've been going back between Germany and the U.S. in recent years, and I've seen when we left the, the when we left Germany in 2013, it seemed like uh, climate change is mainly um, well, climate change is mainly policy matter in Germany. It's not so much about personal action, and that has changed in the past years. And I've seen um, a lot of sort of behavior change and uh, consumption change in the population in Germany. Um, and I feel if we make those conscious choices, we have a community around us that we're influencing, and I think that's very, very important and very powerful, and we still should keep working on that front, I feel. Um, so that is, uh, in one way, it is being solved in Germany is, there is a you know, very big uh, green startup um, culture, about 40% uh, of the startups are actually in the green economy right now, and it's really about changing small, changing products, like going some, to something that is 100% uh, recyclable, um, going back to, you know, trying to reduce waste, um, having supermarkets that are not, that don't offer packaging anymore. You know, that all seems simple on a very small scale, but if you see that sort of rippling through um, to a country and see it become a trend, it's, it's very powerful and it does um, help movements such as the Fridays for Future um, movement and sort of really make that a powerful statement and something that is really supported by the environment and people around it. To me, to me the question of power is just absolutely key here. Um, if, if we look around at what some of the world's most powerful forces or even individuals are doing um, in response to what they perceive as the climate crisis, uh, it's, it's really astounding. You could think about Shell, for example. They've been strategizing how to th thrive and, and, and really you know, top the market, no matter what kind of future uh, unfolds, whether that's one of climate chaos or not, or green New Deal type future. They're ready for either one, um, infrastructurally, uh, you know, investment-wise, everything. Um, you have you know, uh, urban, urban governments around the world are organized not only locally amongst themselves, but with each other in, in big networks funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and so on to develop you know, incredibly audacious infrastructures and, and protect um, you know, markets and investment and tourism and so on. 
Jeff Bezos and you know uh, Amazon and Elon Musk type forces are planning um, to expand into the stars, uh, faced with a, a planet of d uh, dwindling resources here. Right? So we look at that, and then we look at what ordinary people like some of us are doing. We're trying to get to work. We're trying to you know eat and make it to the next day. So so to me the question is how to how to change that uh, crazy asymmetry. <coughs> And, and you know, what would it look like for ordinary people to not just be at the whim of these forces going into this, this future that we face? You know, so I mean, to me, I don't, I don't think there's an answer. And if we had it, it would be, it, if we said we had it, it would be false. Like what's coming next? What framework is needed? But I think if we can try to um, find openings for experimenting even with some of these, these types of, um, you know, new arrangements, new practices, you know, building, building power amongst ordinary people, what would it look like to begin from uh, our own different places that we inhabit, rather than the abstract kind of top-down way of thinking about change, you know? And say, okay, what kind of skills do we need? What kind of infrastructures do we need? You know, how can we rearrange connections between people and institutions across uh, boundaries, like you were saying, locally? Um, I think some of the, the binaries that are being put on us right now are some of the most counter, uh, some of the most reactionary binaries that there could be in the sense that they're keeping people apart, they're keeping people from organizing with each other. Um, so, so materially getting organized uh, at the ground level um, in experimental ways, I think, would be one way forward. Yeah, I, I loved Anna's example of um, climate, like turning around and seeing that your kid is so much taller. These sudden jolts of awareness around a changing climate, and and sort of tagging that to some of what we're talking about um, in terms of being in the long now, not being in the future, makes me think that, that a, a kind of present moment awareness or cultivating the ability to be aware of where we are in the present moment seems like a strategy that, um, that could sit with individuals but also have uh, an impact outside of individuals. So what kind of daily practice can we engage as individuals to make sure that we're um, training in our ability to pay attention? Um, the author, Richard Powers, in the overstory says something about um, having an, an, an ethical requirement to pay attention, and, and that's not easy to do. I mean, two paragraphs into a magazine-length article about how we failed to stop climate change 20 years ago, I'm up getting snacks, and, and, and I have to really train my attention to realize that I can handle it two paragraphs at a time. And, um, and this kind of, um, how do we practice? I think that that's a question I would I would pose. This is phenomenal. I, I should you should come and talk to our people. Um, and the government's, I think this aspect of meditation and the the crazy demands of work really gets in, in front of these things. Um, and and paying attention is when you really pay attention. I mean, all of us have up here have been living with this for a decade or longer, right? And so the, I remember the first moment I sat down with USF Geosciences professor, uh, Jeff Ryan, to be a part of an outreach education NSF project. And I said, well, why can't we do this or this? And he's like, because it's just gonna, you know, he explained to me the substantial impacts that we should be ready to face. And I had to go home and take a nap. My brain was like, I was substantially depressed by it. So we have to understand for the folks who are coming new to this, they, they want to disbelieve. So how do we get beyond that shock and awe and figure out what it takes to find hope, find the opportunity, as fake as it sounds, what's the opportunity of a disaster, well, you know? I mean, I think the need is to help people redefine community. And, and you know, I want to live at a slower pace. I'm gonna hang out and learn things from hope. <laughs> And I think we're seeing that some with the rise of sort of the role of the community scientists. And um, I know um, Tracy Tippin is here from uh, the Blue Green Connection where she's been working to get the Florida Gulf Coast uh, waters off the Florida Gulf Coast was just recognized as a hope spot. And so kind of trying to focus on the special, uh, unique, aspects of the geography and how we can possibly reimagine it to serve us in new ways mm -hmm. and to have an exchange with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So before we open it up to question and answers, uh, I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to offer one takeaway for the audience of what would you suggest to be the most critical action or strategy to prepare? I know CJ kind of mentioned voting as a really important and voting for mass transit as a extremely important aspect that we're facing here in Tampa, the Tampa Bay region. Does anybody have anything they want to add? I mean, I started doing these to-do lists, like how to implement really small things in sort of your daily life when you go around your house and you start, where could I cut waste? Where could I save energy? Yeah, that sounds very primitive and um, simple, but I think um, that gets you sort of in the mode of thinking about it and just really realizing it's not that big of a deal. You know, you just implement it, it takes you a week to get used to it, and then it's fine. You know, I know that the larger infrastructure will not change quickly, we will still depend on ACs, we need cars to get around, um, insulation of houses is not great around here, but um, I think there are small things that you can do, and again, it's, it's kind of the bigger picture, it gets you into the mindset of really caring about it and seeing that it, it is not a big deal, you know. Well, uh, this is not a panacea, but when I'm, whenever I'm teaching and talking with people about um, climate change in the future and all that, inevitably it seems like the conversation always comes back to skills and the feeling that so many people have of having been de-skilled or growing up without the means to deal with their environments, to deal with disasters, to, to get their hands on anything, you know? Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe one thing that I think is very useful as a strategy uh, that, that is small but opens up sort of like a portal into a whole new dimension that you can then follow uh, on, on its own pathways. You know, what, what's one skill that you uh, think is like valuable and strategic for you to learn and to actually learn to practice and to, to actually materially take that up? Um, I, I guess I, I wanna um, just circle back to when Stephanie mentioned um, the role of power in all of this and just offer a thought about this alternate language for Anthropocene, which is racial capitalocene, which really proposes that climate change um, will unevenly distribute its effects um, onto underserved populations, onto the least able to, um, to respond. And we see that in communities in, in our country and globally. And so this notion of, of tuning attention would also apply to um, ideas about anti-colonialism, anti-racism, and what our own privileges are as we move through this crisis, which is a really great point. Yes, and how the, the global north is essentially drowning the global south, mm -hmm. you know, places like, um, I'm just sort of making my first trips there, but places like the Caribbean is not, really not going to make it out of it. Um, and yet you have to stay optimistic, right? News just came out about the ocean rescue finally succeeding in retrieving microplastics from the ocean, right? And yet at the same time, another news about you know, cryptocurrency, hosting cryptocurrency for a year um, has, that has uh, emissions of about a million of transatlantic flights, right? Things you don't really think about, you know, and yet you refuse to use that plastic straw in a restaurant. And <laughs> so it's balancing. Okay, well, I think we're ready to open it up to the audience. So does if anybody have any questions for our panelists? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, so we talk a lot about how art and emotion is what drives us wanting to, to inform ourselves more. And I'm just kind of wondering how each of you go about the differences between informing yourselves versus the creative um, mm -hmm emotional drive of expression. Mm -hmm. So where do you like feel like you maybe need to draw the line between expressing your creativity and using your artwork or your writing to inform the public or your audience? Um, um, oh, oh, go ahead. Sure, please. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's this um, new term called um, climate anxiety and as a Miami Beach resident, it's certainly it's acutely felt uh, among my peers as well. Um, photography and empathy, um, something I think about. Um, for me, you know, like Hope mentioned, uh, timefulness and meditation is just not my thing. 
I can't, I can't meditate. I think photography is my means to channel those emotions. Um, just walking around and processing um, the environment, processing what I see through my lens has been the meditation for me. Um, there's no such thing, I don't believe, as objective photography, you know, objective reportage. It's always somebody's point of view. So in that way, sure, it is political. Um, but it is open enough for, I think, um, again, that viewer and wide audience to interpret it in their way and relate to certain things. Um, yeah. I was going to say that um, Sister Corita Kent, who's this legendary printmaker, had these great rules for her students. Um, and they were made popular by John Cage and Merce Cunningham. And I think number, I don't remember which number, but one of them, maybe out of 10, is don't create and analyze at the same time. <laughs> They're two different processes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just <laughs> channel that for you. <laughs> Does anybody have anything to ask? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, uh, I'm an academic by, by work necessity. <laughs> so I, I write academic articles that have a lot of you know, analytical research and that type of thing in them. And I keep that sphere separate in some sense, um, uh, a certain type of writing, so let's leave it there. And then I, I, I try, if I can, to write in more creative um, outlets for popular audiences, just regular people who want to read some of these things. Um, and I've been trying to experiment a little bit with um, some more creative online stuff. So I'm so I have a website where I'm kind of doing something in the spirit of, of the way you were describing, um, just sort of capturing a moment in time, non-didactic. Um, it's called backloop.tv if you want to look at it. And this is where I just put a lot of sort of the, the visuals from my research um, to sort of capture this moment in time, see how these environments and people are changing on the ground. Um, you know, it's experimental, but it's an outlet to try uh, a, little, a little more visual expression. I also think physical fitness is really one way to deal with some of these mm -hmm. emotional things like that. people are facing. Yeah, we live in bodies, <laughs> yeah. first we and foremost. <laughs> Jessica? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you would expand on the idea of, um, of like, the balance of, of slowing down to address something that, that um, is urgent, because I, there's like this balancing act of, um, you know, taking in from the media, like you were saying, these very um, sort of two-sided, urgent, panic mode, um, which I think if you take in too much of it, it becomes like, okay, I'm going to shut down and do nothing because we're all going to die of fire. Um, <laughs> and like, how do you, how do you then slow down and, and, and channel that urgency into something that you can actually tackle into action? Like, what are your mm -hmm. strategies for doing that or, or helping other people do that here at the bridge? So you have to have a plan, right? And, and that's a daily plan and a weekly plan. And what are the things you care most about? What can you actually affect? And then you need to filter all of the insanity that keeps bubbling up at you, and, and physical fitness is good. Um, <laughs> so, because once you have an understanding of what you need to do or what you want to do, you have to believe in yourself that you're on the right path. You have to tell yourself the narrative that you can make that difference. Because if you, you know, wake up every day with, the, you know, the negative self-talk, the negative radio talk, the negative whatever, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's not productive. So the balancing, but you have to have your own, this is why I'm here on earth today to do this thing, whatever it is, you know, visiting your sick neighbor or, and you've got to stick to your plans. And, and it's not easy. And I get people who are like, well, we're going to go do this today. And then, you know, then the elected officials have a lot of energy and enthusiasm for new ideas. And you have to understand how to filter those new ideas through a lot of different lenses. Like, is this a good new idea? Is this a wackadoodle thing? And, but I'm not going to be the one to judge that. Let's go get some other folks to help us understand what these things are. So this is a long story for whatever, and maybe not the answer. But it's a, it's a kind of a mental practice. Yeah, I think there's a piece. I think there's a piece um, about 
trust, that, um, that you sort of start with this trust that if you pause and you stop the scrolling of the mind, that, um, that some knowing will come. And, and, it's, and, it, and sometimes that, that awareness of what is needed can't break through all the, all the chatter. So it's not about, I'm not, I wouldn't propose not acting, but I think that um, acting from a place of, uh, I said slowness, but you know, acting from a, from a place of pausing and, and trust is a, is a good starting point. Um, slowness uh, and urgency. There's quite a bit of there's quite a bit of alarmist literature around now, and my work, in a way, is alarmist. Um, comes from just living where I am. I live right, right now, precisely uh, across from the Deauville Hotel in Miami Beach. Uh, where a famous 1964 Ed Sullivan show was recorded with the Beatles. Uh, just a little anecdote here. Um, so the Deauville hosted Art Basel, well, NADA, art fair in 2017. I saw that one. There was a small fire there afterwards, and the Deauville is a grand hotel, you know, historic, uh, almost 600 rooms. And then there was Hurricane Irma, that um, caused so much damage that the hotel has never recuperated. Um, Stephanie, you might know some more details about it. It never recuperated, so it's been abandoned ever since. The Grand Hotel on this very narrow strip um, in Miami Beach, where it certainly affected the economy of the entire neighborhood of you know, Mid and North Beach. Um, and there was a little patch of sort of semi-lawn that was right in front of it. So it's between my building uh, and the Deauville, and I called it the, the Beatles lawn. It probably is not, but I think I saw some historic <laughs> photos of the Beatles frolic, you know, frolicking on, the, on that patch of land. Uh, so it's, Deauville is built really close to the ocean. So I think it's the closest building to the ocean in Miami Beach. Um, and that patch of land, adjacent to the abandoned Deauville in the exact same flood zone was just sold for $40 million. It was the last remaining undeveloped patch of land in Miami Beach. So it makes you wonder, you know, how, how much slowness we can afford, you know, and people who are going to be buying property in that patch of land, should they be aware? Um, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if maybe, it's, it's, if not slowness, if, if or, or maybe slowness, but in a different sense, if, if maybe getting sort of like a grasp on our on our emotions and our mind is, is very important too, in some sense, you know? We're just inundated by information. We're living in algorithmic determined realities in so many ways. Um, and we're constantly being stimulated by crisis alerts of all different kinds, whether it's about the environment or whatever the, the new one is this week, you know? Um, and it, it's impossible to, to, to be um, clear in that context, and that's become our norm. That's become our baseline as human beings, and it's, it's you know it's actually transforming us as human beings. Um, and you know, if you, I, I've read some very interesting articles about how the people who actually developed like the like button um, and who develop a lot of the social media um, that, that we use refuse to use it and, and don't allow their own families to use it and things like that because they know exactly what it's doing to them, right? Yes. Right? So all right. So what about us again, right? Um, and to me, it's, it's a really big question. And physical fitness to me is only part of a, a way of grappling with this. But how do we how do we regain our own uh, minds and and you know emotions? Um, and doing that, there's so many different ways to do that. Meditate on dying. Meditate on the fact that you're mortal. Meditate. Period. I guess I don't do that. But you know, do cross <laughs> whatever it is. You know. But um, in order to then try to open up a space to see clearly, I think that that's so so hard to do right now, yeah. and so important to reclaim. I mean, we're talking about a fundamental mentality change on sort of a personal level and a broader collective societal level. Like, how do we implement the less is more into sort of, and that, that I think comes with the slowness, you know, like how can we sort of, how can we be okay with doing less um, in more time and sort of focusing on important things as um, CJ has mentioned. And I think that's, 
we have to do that. I mean, we're kind of losing our mind right now, and that's not only due to sort of the ecological crisis, but sort of due to all that, you know, chatter and that sort of uh, accelerating, um, which is really sort of driving us mad as society. So I think that that um, slowness kind of uh, permeates or that thinking about how to slow down and how to sort of make less more um, will is sort of valid in in our lives and like general. Yes. From, a, um, from an educational perspective, I work with K-12 educators and I'm trying to, um, it, working with sustainability and getting their kids to understand the environment. From your perspective, looking at art as a medium, I'm going to be doing workshops. What, is your, what would your advice be that I could give to teachers to help inspire children so that they start from an age where that is their perspective? Hmm. Interestingly, they're quite um, aware already. Climate change or environmentalism, from what I know, is not yet mandatory subject. My son is in elementary school, but he came in one day and said, I'll get you a room in my house in the mountains one day, Mom. Don't worry. I am very, <laughs> I'm woke to the problem, and I'm not going to be staying here. So... I think they pick it up, you know, from just the, the environment around them. How do we keep them there, though? How do, we, how do we keep them there? How do we help them use art to keep them there and inspire others? I mean, I would, I would say to encourage them to pursue their own creative expression, where mm -hmm. they can, you know, find that as a way to occupy themselves rather than potentially being on screens. Talk about inside art. Oh yeah, so we have a, a program the, with um, the museum and the, Depart uh, the College of Education here with Barbara Cruz and our Deputy Director Noelle Smith develop a curriculum um, a platform off of our exhibitions that engages with, uh, is it? Secondary schools. Secondary schools, so middle schools. Um, and it's social studies and contemporary art. Right, but the teachers are social studies and art teachers. And, yeah, visual art teachers. Yeah, so, um, and they come in and hear from the artists and they build a curriculum around it to explore a range of, of topics. So for this uh, round, this semester, they're engaging with the Sponge Exchange, the history of uh, Tarpon Springs, but also looking at their construction of monuments and exploring how they're sort of representing history through the monuments in Turpin Springs. And the lesson plans are free. The lesson plans are free. And, give you the link. and they're available on our website. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just on, on that you think you had a question. Oh, please go ahead. No, I was just gonna mention the phenomenal work that has been done at Stepping Stones with engaging um, students through photography and other things and bringing them uh, you know, around to different places so that they can observe it. And I've seen a, a great installation that was at HCC maybe three or four years ago, lots of creative things. And so there's, there's um, lots of work that was supported by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. They do these little mini education environmental grants. So you might look at the Tampa Bay Estuary Program's website as for other inspirational ideas. They do a lot of it, so. Yeah. It's, I don't know how artsy or education it is. I just know that there's a lot of, and it does bring kids into contact with these kind of things, so. Yeah, I would just maybe make the connection between um, environmental health and, and human health and the fact that those two things are kind of on a continuum, of course, and um, put forward this movement of mindfulness in the classroom for K through 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like if we can just get our nervous systems grounded, we can go from there.
That is a yeah. great question. Oh my. Yeah. I mean, I'm like the <coughs> least good person to talk about anything to do with the art market, so I'm going to um, take a pass on that one. But I guess, um, and I, I, I don't know that I, I have a fantastic answer to your question, but I do want to offer up um, some of the things that are going on in Richmond, Virginia right now with the new Institute for Contemporary Art. I think it would be really interesting to look at what that programming has been, um, just living in Richmond and watching a new cultural institution open um, after Trump's election and the way that institution is trying to address some of the very important parts of your question um, would, be, would be worth a look. And then um, doing our own work as artists and practitioners to try to, to name it and educate ourselves, <laughs> I think, too. Thank you for your question. Yeah. I think through our programming at the Institute, we try to, you know, shed a light on a lot of um, different globally working artists. Uh, we did a show, I guess it was a year ago, um, The Visible Turn, that was looking at, uh, you know, trying to shed light and, and allow some of these artists maybe that haven't been um, as represented to be represented in the issues that they're dealing with. Um, I know our my fellow colleagues are also working on a show that should open in the fall um, that's uh, highlighting Puerto Rican artists and artists from the diaspora and post Maria. So trying to create awareness and um, a platform to discuss sort of the evolving conditions on the island, especially now in light of the recent earthquakes. Um, so. As far as the art market, you know, that's a, a larger issue. I mean, there have been discussions as recently as the last Art Basel Miami in Miami about the, the problems with um, the art fair circuit and even environmental concerns of shipping and transportation and f people flying, jet setting all over the world and how even just all the crates and all the things that are made to present the work and how it is just, you know, very uh, disposable. And so those are some really large issues that I think the entire market needs to face. Mm -hmm. um, artists working outside of the market, like oh, uh, doing socially engaged projects, which you curate. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not in the art market, but I, I know a lot of people who are dealing with the questions exactly that you're asking. Um, and, I, and I think that one thing I think we're seeing, and maybe we're going to see more, I don't know, is it seems like a lot of people who feel, who are in the art world, who feel that the, the existing institutions are outdated or don't do what they want to do or are actually like super, super restrictive and going nowhere, they're leaving them and creating, trying to create new ones and experiment with new kind of structures. Yes. Um, and I think we're going to see that more and more as the need for uh, really transformative stuff kind of grows and people just feel stifled by what, by what the, the pressures of the market are, but the pressures of the, the, you know, the bureaucracies even of some of the, the institutions that they're in, whether they're publications or museums or whatever, galleries. Um, and, and so I, 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 a couple interesting examples that I can think of just off the top of my head. Um, a, a good friend of mine, Amy Saul, who, who's in New York, um, she, she's starting a journal called Sanu Journal, and it's about um, African culture and all, all different components. She also deals with you know, Instagram and fashion and all of this, and it's a, it's a really cool, super independent project. Um, and, and I happen to be wearing this shirt also, this a project called New Models, but this is a, another instance of some people who were in different aspects of the art world um, leaving some of those like publication uh, journal in environments to start, uh, try, to, try to create a space and opening where you could ask new questions, but with, you know, still doing art. You know. And we're seeing that too with some of the artists moving out of the gallery structure and kind of becoming more entrepreneurial on their own, um, rather than feeling like they have to work in that gallery sort of paradigm. Mm -hmm. You see, um, it's, it's going to take multiple players as usual, and the awareness of the issue, you know, the visibility has increased, so that's the good news. Um, I'm sure you saw 
um, the news about the Baltimore Museum of Art only buying work from women artists this year, which you think that's a bold move. And in, in terms of, um, right, in terms of the, the visibility of the issue, that's a, that's a major gesture um, on a tangent. But, you know, I, I live in Miami Beach in Art Basel, and I visited it on the last day. And I remember scrolling through my Instagram feed and the infamous Jerry Salts. Uh, saying something, what was, when was the last time you cried? Because of, you know, when was the last time art made you cry? And I thought, oh, never, it's been, never, really. And then I saw Theaster Gates, and I cried. And, you know, that was, <laughs> I think, <laughs> the accomplishment of the day, yeah. Does anybody have anything to add? Uh, Luke? Um, oh. Yeah, Luke. Uh, first of all, I could How do we like not preach to the choir with our work and like actually reach people that don't self-select to attend a, you know, a talk like this? I mean, this is something I, you know, I think we all struggle with in the institution, and this is kind of what I think the role of public art and socially engaged work is like getting it out into non-traditional spaces, if you will. Um, to doing public performances, to you know anything from some sort of, I'm using the term guerrilla, but even if it's a sanctioned sort of ad campaign that just shifts people's mind a little bit when they come across something and it's a little bit unexpected and people it stops and may, makes people think a little bit, you know. And I, I just think there's value in that space. Yes, I'm Margaret. Just to add one thing. So, so some of the artists that we work with have one foot in the gallery structure and another foot in trying to actually use art as a, and its transformational power or as a catalyst for change. The Astor Gates, that is an experiment. That is a social experiment with using his ability to, to uh, get a lot of money for his artwork and then feed it back into an experiment. Sure, there's some criticisms of this experiment. But the way he's engaged the neighborhood is really quite remarkable. Nick Cave is another artist that does that. Uh, Pedro Reyes. Um, I'm thinking of Bosco Sodi and the uh, and the and the uh, foundation that he has in in Oaxaca. Just as a few things that come to mind. Also, we see new entrepreneurial models for trying to support creative capital, like Meow uh, Wolf. Wolf or locally crab devil or fairgrounds in which we're trying to find, uh, entrepreneurs are trying to find new ways to help artists make a living and contribute to their communities. So I think there are some experiments and new ways of using the arts and their transformational power. And we're trying to tap into that and give a, format, a, a forum and a platform for that and Sarah's work with these two exhibitions, I think, is an example uh, of, of what museums can do today to address some of the issues that you bring up. Oh, uh, a much broader, those are amazing, I took tons of notes. There's a much, there's a broader um, human opportunity in that, and is to find the issues that you care about, but that are beyond your normal sphere. So I actually worked in uh, food and agriculture for many years before the adaptation, and what I've found is that I've perceived that their voices are not at the normal table that affect climate change and development. So I need to proactively go and, and meet them where they are at. And so there's a smart climate farmer ag thing, and, and there's a lot of knowledge that's just being developed. So you have to think about what is it you care about, 
but where is your circle of normal engagement not meeting them? And then go to them, join the Rotary, which sounds insane, or get involved in, not to say anything against Rotary, but the, the idea is what is the, what is the group that you care about? Where are those people? And then we, we all have to make the effort. You gotta go give a speech. We gotta talk to, we gotta sit there and listen to them understand what their issues and their priorities are, and then can we offer some support mm -hmm. to those things? And if it aligns with your deep beliefs and your goals and your skills, and there's a thread there, then you figure out what it is. So I'm, somebody is in now in, asked to talk to me about carbon credits for agriculture. It doesn't seem like, you know, we're kind of an urban area, but I know that three out of the four, six counties have big agricultural spaces, so I have to understand that. Are farmers gonna trust me? I'm not so sure. I need to go meet them and listen to them so I gain their worldview and understand what they have and then figure out how does this line up with carbon reduction, preserving open land, uh, flood reduction. So anyway, go out and meet new people and um, it's all fearful to me. I'm here with artists now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you're doing it, you're, you're the model. I think um, the choir, I thought about that a lot um, and with photography, um, the choir, you never know where that message is going to be carried you know, further. Uh, you never know where things are going to travel and what you might inspire. Um, just a sort of real life example here. Um, when uh, the New Yorker picked up um, my work for an article back in August, I think September, they did a feature on Flood Zone. And it's not like you know the New Yorker audience needs to learn about climate change through my photography whatsoever. But um, and then I had this meeting with um, a group of Russian collectors doing again the Art Basel, and I found myself having to defend science um, <laughs> in Russian, and I'm sort of clumsy in both languages now. Uh, it was extra difficult, you know. And I was like, no, no, that's not a marketing shtick. It's very real. Look at my picture. This is my street, and just look at the book. Um, and then next week um, I will be giving my first interview in Russian for a Russian publication who saw that article on the New Yorker and heard and so this is how you just never know where things are going to travel and it's going to be old flood zone yeah yeah I think nurturing that sort of serendipity of the message and how it gets out that was something that we thought about a lot in um, the exhibit that we did in Austin where we kind of we came in a little different sort of using the exhibit the art exhibit the art gallery on campus is sort of a platform to um, to mediate science and to talk about science and to kind of get it into the back door. And it was amazing to see, um, it was an experiment for the art department as well. Um, and what we presented in the end was a very sort of traditional art exhibit, a group show that um, combined very different um, art practitioners. We had designers, we had visual activists, but we had the scientists in there. And um, I just loved watching the audience. We had text that sort of stand was standing next to the um, the artwork, which we kind of wanted to sort of work those many different ways that they could. And um, we heard about a group of 15 firefighters coming in. So one of the, um, the professors at the art department has a sister who is a firefighter, and she came in, she loved the exhibit, and she brought her firefighter friends in, 15 of them. And she never did that for any of the shows of her sister. So there was something else that uh, was communicated to that show and that was in that show that sort of captured their intention and that they felt was closer to, to home and sort of brought that in. But that is um, something we couldn't have planned for in advance. But what we did is, um, and Sarah mentioned that before, is we did extensive programming. And for that programming, we were looking for partners that um, were sort of in different departments that brought their own audience, a very different audience that would never have thought about computational oceanography before. Um, and we brought in all of the uh, involved artists um, to sort of speak and to, to, to express their own um, sort of uh, practice or to talk about their practice and their processes. And that was very important to sort of not only present the artwork, but let the artists speak about their process and how they sort of get to... What, what, what university was that? That was the University of Texas at Austin. I have to say, university museums have a role okay. that very important. city museums don't always take up. Absolutely. Kind of yeah. And what, what we felt too is like, you think university museums, you're again preaching to the choir, you have uh, students, but no, you're like, this is the formative years. That is where you can really make a difference and where you can reach out to these young people and plant um, seats and ideas into their minds. And that was very, 
I found very inspiring and um, very good place, the University Museum. <laughs> very fertile. Well, we're, I know we have one more question. We've run over our time, and so I just want to be respectful of people's time, and I really appreciate everyone coming, and to all of our panelists, thank you so much for sharing thank your you, brilliant perspectives. You. And um, I encourage you all to pick up our brochures. Our panel of, uh, our listing of events are on the cards on the table. We have a very robust program of events, and I hope you all will continue to engage with these exhibitions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.